I'm Bates Skill. I'm the uh, Chief Executive Officer of the United States Studies Center at the University of Sydney. Um, I see so many uh, familiar faces and want to welcome you to joining us again and, uh, and to anyone who's been here for the first time. We're also very pleased you could join us. Uh, the United States Studies Center was established in 2007. Uh, its intention is to help raise awareness and understanding of the United States here in Australia and around the world, uh, and uh, with an ambition uh, to be one of the world's leading centers uh, for the study and understanding of the United States, uh, not only in Australia, uh, but all around, uh, all around the region and in the world. Um, we do this through three uh, main sets of activities. One very important to us and near to our heart is uh, providing education uh, to uh, persons in Australia, uh, ranging from high school to postgraduate and PhD students, uh, taking our courses, uh, taking part in our workshops and seminars, and also uh, increasingly um, taking part in our student study and intern abroad opportunities, which we arrange through the U.S. Studies Center in the United States. Um, these opportunities have been primarily available to students at the University of Sydney, but we are uh, increasing uh, the availability of these sorts of programs, both our coursework as well as our student study abroad programs, uh, to students outside of the University of Sydney, uh, such as at the University of Western Australia and elsewhere, and we'll be expanding those programs going forward. Uh, secondly, uh, we also undertake uh, academic and think tank research where we uh, raise funding with uh, corporations, with governments, with uh, private foundations uh, so that we can undertake uh, serious research looking at issues of concern to the United States and Australia. Try to draw lessons uh, from American experience, see how well they apply here in Australia and vice versa. And cover the range of topics, uh, not just sort of the traditional issues of politics, economics, uh, history or foreign policy, but branching out into other areas of concern to our two nations, uh, whether that be resources and sustainability, uh, long-term energy futures, comparative Wests, what we can learn about the uh, respective experiences of our two countries with regard to the Western regions of our country. Uh, music, arts, media, culture, the list goes on and on, um, and we are so pleased that it really is a bottomless uh, set of issues that our two countries share in common and from which we can learn from one another. And then lastly, uh, we try to meet our mandate by carrying out public outreach functions as we are this evening, uh, by conducting a variety of activities where we try to interact with the interested public, whether that be through uh, broadcast or internet-based media, uh, conferences, uh, and also uh, public lectures such as we're going to have tonight. And we're very, very pleased to be able to have the opportunity to invite a number of leading uh, voices from the United States, again, from a range of issue areas who can come to Australia, spend a good bit of time with us here, interact with audiences like this, and so we can all learn from one another and deepen, I think, our understanding between the two countries and uh, and deepen the understanding we have of each other. So tonight is going to be one of these very, very special evenings. and I'm really looking forward to the opportunity. Um, about a year ago, uh, I had the chance to be working with uh, Professor Walt uh, jointly with him on a board uh, in Singapore for the Roger Rotnam School of International Studies and thought it would be a great idea if we could try to get him to come to Australia. All the more so uh, since this is the first time. I surely hope it's not the last. Uh, that he has been able to make a visit uh, to Australia. And in addition to what we're going to hear from him tonight, we're keeping him very, very busy uh, traveling him around the country, not just here in Sydney, but traveling to Canberra, and uh, early next week also uh, out to Perth, where we'll be um, uh, working with him alongside our sister institution at the University of Western Australia, uh, the U.S. Asia Center, uh, in part um, uh, undertaking some activities in relation to their major conference out there called uh, In the Zone that's going to be on May 1st. So we're keeping them extremely busy in spite of the fact that for most people in this room, Steve, uh, this is a kind of a vacation 
week. So it, it says a lot that we've had such a great turnout for you, uh, even though I think uh, it seems like half the city of Sydney is off getting a suntan um, somewhere. Um, for those of you that don't know Stephen Walt, uh, this is really a very, very special opportunity for us. Um, I mean, very, very formally here, Steve is uh, the Robert and Renee Belfer Professor of International Affairs at Harvard University, a part of the Harvard Kennedy School. He previously taught at Princeton and at the University of Chicago. So just name those three universities alone and you already recognize that this is a very high achieving scholar. But he's also worked in the public policy side of things, uh, having been associated with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, a think tank in Washington, D.C., uh, also at the Brookings Institution, another well-known think tank in Washington, and with such institutions in Washington as the Institute of Defense Analyses, the Center uh, for Naval Analyses, and the National Defense University. He is very importantly on the editorial board of some of the premier uh, journals in the international relations field, uh, including the journal International Relations uh, and uh, Foreign Policy. And he has uh, published a number of major works uh, in his field, uh, including The Origins of Alliances, uh, the uh, book called Revolution and War, the volume Taming American Power, the Global Response to U.S. Primacy, and he's working now uh, on a book uh, which he's going to give us a little taste of uh, today in his talk about the uh, uh, difficulties America has had uh, in spite of its uh, unipolar moment and uh, victory, we could say, uh, following the end of the Cold War. Most importantly, though, I want to stress that uh, Steve is a very special individual in that in spite of the remarkable success he's had within, American, uh, within the American Academy, he's also had remarkable success as a public policy intellectual, uh, as an opinion leader, as a thought leader, as a pundit, as a person who has a very uh, active and, and uh, well-respected uh, blog uh, who is turned to from a variety of angles in the United States for really fresh incisive, interesting thought about American foreign policy and American role in the world. I can tell you, uh, I know it's true here, it's certainly true in the United States, uh, it's very difficult uh, to be both uh, a tenured professor at Harvard, an accomplished scholar, and be active within the uh, public policy and think tank space, and uh, Stephen has done it with great aplomb and success. So I think um, we're fortunate then, again, uh, to have a, a person of such accomplished scholarly uh, credentials, but also someone who can talk to us uh, at the level of public policy that's going to be very, very fascinating. Um, so please do welcome me uh, as we hear from Stephen talk about the foils and follies of American foreign policy. Thank Thanks, you very much. Thanks, very much. <coughs> uh, thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here in Australia for the first time. Um, and I want to thank Bates for the invitation, the U.S. Studies Center for supporting the trip, and of course all of you for coming tonight. Uh, the United States and Australia have been allies for a long time now, and both countries have an interest in what the other is up to. If I were Australian, I would certainly want to pay some attention to what the United States might be doing in the world, and I'm sorry to say that you should be somewhat worried. Um, in particular, the topic I want to explore today is why the United States doesn't seem to be very good at foreign policy anymore. And I'm going to be rather critical of my own country, but I just want to say at the outset and emphasize that I'm not suggesting that the foreign policy elites, the people running uh, my country, are evil, wicked, careless, mendacious, or unusually selfish. Uh, the problem is a little different than that. I think actually uh, my country is very well intentioned, but for a variety of reasons doesn't seem to be accomplishing what it sets out to do. Now this wasn't always the case. Uh, between 1945 and 1952, for example, a rather small group of American foreign policy officials created many of the key institutions that still underpin the global order, like NATO, the World Bank, the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund, one could add the alliance with Australia to that list. They formulated the strategy of containment, did the Marshall Plan, managed crises in several areas, and they did this while facing a geopolitical rival with a lot of military power and that had millions of sympathizers around the world at that time. Their record was not perfect, but it was a pretty impressive set of achievements. 
Similarly, between 1988 and 1992, the first Bush administration, Bush 41, managed the collapse of the Soviet Union, the reunification of Germany, and the end, uh, the end of the Cold War, and the first Gulf War. Again, not a perfect record. They made some mistakes, but on the whole, a positive performance. By contrast, the record of American foreign policy since then is at best mixed and at worst a failure even though the end of the Cold War left the United States on rather good terms with virtually everyone around the world. Yet despite that advantage, we failed to secure a Middle East peace despite the Oslo Accords. Today, Middle East peace is probably farther away than ever. North Korea, India, and Pakistan all tested nuclear weapons despite strong American opposition. We failed to build a positive relationship with Russia mostly because we kept expanding NATO and doing other things that inflamed Russian sensitivities. And then, of course, we got blindsided by their response in Ukraine, a relationship arguably worse now than at any time since 1992. Al-Qaeda attacked American facilities overseas several times in the 1990s and then struck the American homeland on 9-11. We responded by invading Afghanistan and then Iraq, even though Iraq had nothing to do with the 9-11 attack. To make it worse, the United States and its allies failed to win a clear victory in either war, despite spending several trillion dollars and thousands of lives. We've been at odds with Iran for over 30 years, but we passed up several Iranian overtures to improve the relationship and instead put tremendous pressure on Iran to end its nuclear program. The result, Iran had zero centrifuges operating in the year 2000. It has over 11,000 spinning today. And finally, I would argue that the American response to the Arab Spring has been haphazard at best. We helped push Mubarak out. Then we welcomed the Egyptian military back in two years later. We turned a blind eye to the suppression of democratic protesters in Bahrain, but then intervened to overthrow Muammar Gaddafi creating a failed state in Libya. Now, there are some successes in this period, the Dayton Accords that ended the Bosnian War, an improved relationship with India, but overall, this is not a record that is gonna win anybody prizes. Yes, I know, Obama did get the Nobel Peace Prize in 2009, but it's hard to argue that he's earned it. And what makes all this even more surprising is that the United States now has a foreign policy establishment that is larger, more extensive than it was back in 1945. It's staffed with lots of knowledgeable people. We have hundreds of academics and policy analysts in and outside of government to provide officials with expert advice. Given all that, you would think we would be doing better. But as I'm gonna argue in a few minutes, it's actually the nature of our foreign policy establishment that's part of the problem. So let me start by describing the American position in the world because that's the taproot of much of this. And then I'm gonna describe that foreign policy establishment and explain why what it does actually tends to produce counterproductive results. I'll consider one counter argument to my position and then I'll, I'll wrap up with a, a note of optimism. Um, <laughs> the, I have to. <laughs> The first thing to recognize is the United States is in a truly remarkable geopolitical position. It is still the world's largest, most sophisticated economy, the only country in the world with global military capabilities. We still spend more on defense than the next 10 countries put together. We're also separated from all the other centers of world power by these two enormous oceans, and we're protected further by the deterrent power of thousands of nuclear weapons. We are the most secure great power in the history of the world. This creates a paradox. Because the United States is so powerful and so secure, it has the freedom to wander all over the world and intervene in lots of places if it wants to. But at the same time, there are hardly any international outcomes out there that would really have a decisive impact on American security, especially since the Soviet Union imploded. In fact, when the United States gets involved overseas and things go badly, as they did in Indochina, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, eventually we just come home and we're perfectly fine. Now this favorable position creates some real difficulties when it comes to foreign policy. First of all, when you're so strong and so secure, it's hard to set a clear strategy and stick to it. Strategy is all about setting priorities. 
And we are so well off, we often forget there actually might be limits to what we can do. For example, had someone proposed attacking Iraq during the Cold War, this would have been viewed as reckless, dangerous, it would have been rejected immediately. But with the United States in an unrivaled position after 1992, the risk seems small. It's harder to rule such crazy ideas out at first hearing. In fact, US presidents instead face constant pressure to do something. We're the only power with a global military presence. We, in fact, divide the world into regional combatant commands, like Central Command, or Africa Command, or Pacific Command. So if anything bad happens anywhere in the world, we have a commander for the region, we have forces nearby, and people automatically think American credibility is engaged. As a result, America's foreign policy agenda tends to be overcrowded. But at the same time, because the United States is so powerful and so secure, it's really not worth spending an enormous amount of blood or treasure on most of those problems. In short, because we're in such a favorable position, our foreign policy is both ambitious and feckless. We try to do a lot, but as long as we don't have to work too hard at it. And one final point here is our position of primacy also encourages both allies and adversaries to act in ways that can complicate or make it harder to achieve our goals. Our adversaries, other states that are worried about American power, sometimes take steps to check us in various ways, as Russia and China have done with respect to Syria, as some other countries have done, where they try to acquire weapons of mass destruction, etc. Um, finally, our dominant position also allows many of our allies to free ride on American protection, so the United States ends up bearing a larger share of many of these burdens. Roughly 90% of the costs in Iraq and Afghanistan were borne by the United States. Bottom line is that even if the United States had the best system of foreign policy making that human ingenuity could devise, it would still have a tough time managing the world as it is trying to do now. Now, unfortunately, the system that we have falls rather short of that ideal. So let me now take a look inside the foreign policy establishment and try to explain why it's become so dysfunctional. In a democracy, policy is not just determined by government officials. It's also shaped by a variety of institutions in civil society. And that's especially true in the United States, which has a very open system of government, one where interest groups and other organizations can work 24-7 to influence what the government does. So to understand American foreign policy, you also have to look at the entire establishment, not just the people who happen to be in government. By this establishment, I mean the formal institutions of government. Um, there are roughly, by the way, about 700,000 civilian employees in the U.S. Department of Defense, just the Department of Defense, plus a vast array of private companies doing contract work for them. It also includes membership organizations like the World Affairs Councils or the Council on Foreign Relations, which tries to raise public and elite awareness of foreign policy. It's think tanks like the ones Bates mentioned, Brookings, Carnegie, many, many others. It's special interest groups and lobbies that intervene in politics to try and advance some particular foreign policy cause, whether that's an ethnic lobby, human rights organizations, defense contractors, arms control groups, and many, many others. And finally, you have to include members of the media who cover foreign affairs and can play a big role in shaping public opinion. And I would also add academia, and especially schools of public policy and international affairs like my own employer. Academics do consulting work. They sometimes serve in government themselves. And they train most of the people who then fill all those government jobs in the foreign affairs bureaucracy. There are two features of this establishment that deserve special emphasis. First, it's a community. Especially at the highest level, the foreign policy establishment is a group of people who all know each other and who do a lot of mutual back scratching. Members of these different institutions overlap in lots of ways, and key people often hold multiple positions in the course of a career. I'll just give you one example. Leslie Gelb, former president of the Council on Foreign Relations, receives a PhD in government from Harvard, teaches at Wesleyan University, then becomes an aide 
on the sen in the Senate, then goes to work at the Pentagon. After the Pentagon, he goes to Brookings, then back to the State Department. Then he goes to the New York Times, where he's the national security correspondent for the New York Times, and eventually becomes president of the Council on Foreign Relations. And this is not an unusual biography for someone in the foreign policy establishment. Other prominent people can hold multiple positions at the same time. David Sanger is White House correspondent for the New York Times, writes frequently on foreign affairs. He also teaches a class on US foreign policy at the Kennedy School, where I work. My colleagues Joe Nye and Nicholas Burns both have served in government, both teach, both have chaired the Aspen Strategy Group. And then there are the power couples like Peter Baker, reporter for the New York Times, his wife Susan Glasser, the editor of Politico uh, magazine, or Victoria Newland at the State Department, Assistant Secretary for Eurasian Affairs, Robert Kagan, prominent public intellectual at the Carnegie Endowment. And I could go on and on and on. So it's a community. Second, with very rare exceptions, the individuals and institutions I've just been talking about are strongly committed to American global leadership and using American power to force or convince others to adapt to American preferences. In general, the foreign policy establishment sees America as a consistently positive force in the world. They think the United States is a little different than everybody else. It has the right and responsibility to manage world politics. Uh, they support active efforts to spread democracy, to weaken enemies, to stop proliferation, to advance human rights, and to pull as many states as possible into the U.S. orbit. What all of this means is that in the eyes of most people who work on foreign policy in the United States, we are not a status quo power. But if other states or groups object to what the United States is doing, it's because they just don't understand that we're acting for the greater good or we think it's because they're being misled by some set of selfish, greedy, old-fashioned, or evil leaders. What I'm trying to suggest here is just as there is an imbalance of power between the United States and most of the rest of the world, the United States much more powerful, there's also an imbalance of power inside the United States between organizations and groups that favor a lot of American global activism and those who favor greater restraint. If you think about the Washington environment, there are relatively few think tanks, for example, who think the United States should be doing less in the world. The only one prominent one I can think of is the Libertarian Cato Institute, and it's a rather lonely voice inside Washington. Well, you put this together, and there's a powerful tendency for the United States to get overcommitted, because virtually every part of the foreign policy establishment is trying to get the U.S. government to do something somewhere on behalf of someone. They don't always agree on what the policy should be, but the entire establishment tends to lean forward in terms of American global engagement. Most importantly, this establishment is more supportive of global activism than the public at large. In 2009, for example, 50% of Council on Foreign Relations members supported increasing the U.S. military presence in Afghanistan. Only 32% of the American public did. In 2006, 60% of Americans thought the United States was doing more than its share to help less fortunate countries. Last time, for the first time since 19, or last December, for the first time since 1964, more than 50% of Americans said they believed, quote, the United States should mind its own business internationally and let other countries get along the best they can on their own. So that raises the following puzzle. How does the foreign policy elite convince the rest of the country to go along with a rather ambitious international presence? They'd use a number of strategies to pull this off. And unfortunately, some of these strategies tend to get us into trouble. The first and most obvious one is threat inflation. Exaggerate global dangers because it's really the only way to convince the American people to support a very ambitious foreign policy. As I've already suggested, the United States is in fact an extraordinarily secure country, yet ever since World War II, we've tended to depict relatively minor threats in the most god-awful terms. In the McCarthy period, the early 1950s, many Americans genuinely believed communists were infiltrating all sorts of American institutions, including the Department of State. During Vietnam, American leaders genuinely believed 
that defeat would cause dominoes to fall around the world and undermine our entire global position. Of course, it was the Soviet Union that actually eventually collapsed, not the United States. Today, we treat third-rate powers like Iraq or Iran as if they were 10 feet tall. Just as a refresher here, Iran's defense budget is about half the size of Australia's. Right? Yet 83% of Americans see it as a critical threat to US interests. We also tend to obsess about our own credibility and worry that if we don't bomb Syria or do something about Crimea, allies elsewhere will lose confidence in American protections. Uh, finally, we continue to obsess about the threat of international terrorism, but the actual danger that terrorism poses to the United States is quite small. Not zero. I'm from Boston, so it's not zero. But it's relatively modest compared to many other dangers. You are, in fact, if you're an American, you are more likely to be injured by slipping in your bathroom than by al-Qaeda. Yet American politicians are not declaring a war on slippery tile floors. The reason we do threat inflation, of course, is because the American people basically understand the country's pretty secure and politicians have to work overtime to mobilize support for a more active policy. But if the public is repeatedly being told about looming dangers everywhere, it's going to go along with decisions for preventive war. It'll sometimes go along with the torture of suspected terrorists or targeted killings by drones even if those responses actually make the problem worse. The point is, if we didn't constantly exaggerate dangers, we would be less likely to intervene in places we don't understand particularly well. Second part of selling global activism is essentially to rig the marketplace of ideas. In theory, democracy should be better at making policy because more information is available and the public and politicians can debate different alternatives openly. This competition is supposed to weed out bad policies, make it easier to correct mistakes. The system doesn't work particularly well in foreign policy. For starters, the government has lots of ways to manipulate information. It can classify things it doesn't want the public to know. It can prosecute journalists or whistleblowers. It can leak information selectively to build support. And the problem here is that ordinary citizens don't have independent sources of information. If the roads are crumbling or the economy is in trouble, ordinary citizens can see it for themselves. But what they know about al-Qaeda or Afghanistan or Iran's nuclear program or trade policy comes mostly from the government and the media. In short, it comes from the foreign policy establishment itself. I think this problem is magnified by an increasingly incestuous relationship between government and media. Instead of being sort of aggressive watchdogs, reporters and editors actually depend on close ties with government officials. They're all, in a sense, part of the same club. Um, so back in 2008, for example, the Pentagon Press Office uh, was caught uh, giving retired generals VIP tours in Iraq and Afghanistan and then shopping those retired generals out to media outlets in the United States to provide reports on how the war was going. Uh, which, of course, that tended to be very favorable. And the result was the American people got a biased assessment of how both wars uh, were going. Similarly, in both Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, General David Petraeus worked overtime to cultivate good relations with the press and also with various academic and think tank experts who he brought there as outside consultants. Surprise, surprise, when these consultants returned back to the United States, they tended to write very optimistic reports about how the war effort was going. I should mention, uh, academics are suckers for this sort of attention from, from officials. Finally, there just isn't that much really serious debate in Washington over many aspects of foreign policy. It is worth remembering that of all the senior officials in the Obama administration, the only one who opposed the decision to invade Iraq in 2003 was President Obama himself. Most of his other senior foreign policy officials openly supported that decision. There's just not that much difference between Democrats and Republicans on most big foreign policy issues. And, uh, third strategy here is to essentially protect the members of the foreign policy establishment from 
accountability. Right? If you don't hold people accountable for poor performance, it's hard to imagine improving. And bear with me while I give you several examples of this. In, in a sense, the poster child for this should be the neoconservative movement in the United States. They developed and sold the whole idea of invading Iraq. They've exercised a lot of influence. Uh, given how uh, their foreign policy turned out, you'd think they'd be utterly discredited at this point. But they remain an influential voice. Uh, a couple of specific examples. Elliot Abrams, convicted of lying to Congress in the Reagan administration, pardoned by the first President Bush, reappointed in the second Bush administration, where he supports the Iraq war and helps foment a civil war in Gaza that's supposed to eliminate Hamas, but Hamas actually wins the civil war instead, leaves government and becomes a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. Paul Wolfowitz, another architect of the Iraq War, his predictions about the war were all turned out to be false, but when he left the Pentagon after four years, President Bush picked him to be president of the World Bank, even though, by the way, he wasn't an economist or a development expert. He served two years in that job and then has to resign over a series of ethics violations, where he then returns to the American Enterprise Institute as a senior fellow. Elizabeth Obeji, uh, a name that you may not know, a supposed Syria expert at a think tank called the Institute for the Study of War. She was forced to resign when it came out that she'd misrepresented her credentials. She'd claimed to have a PhD, but she'd never actually been to graduate school. So she had to resign. A week later was hired to work as a foreign policy aide by Senator John McCain. For the past 20 years, the same small group of people have been handling the Middle East peace process most of them connected to various uh, organizations like APAC. So, so, for example, John Kerry's main deputy handling the Israeli-Palestinian negotiations is Martin Indyk, formerly from Australia, also formerly of APAC, and the Sabin Center at Brookings. He was Assistant Secretary of State and Ambassador to Israel in the Clinton administration, and a key part of the U.S. team back then. In short, the United States has been using the same people to, who have repeatedly failed to get a peace deal for the last 20 years. This is like a rugby team using the same coach and the same players for 20 straight losing seasons and then expecting a different result this time around. One final example, James Clapper, a current director of Central Intelligence, who told Congress that the National Security Agency was not spying on Americans. When this lie was exposed, he admitted he had not told the truth, and he apologized. The problem is that lying to Congress is actually a felony offense in the United States. Clapper still has his job. Now, meanwhile, whose careers suffer? Well, it's the people who get it right. So just one example, Colonel Paul Yingling served several tours in Iraq and wrote a blistering article criticizing the senior leadership of the Army. Uh, the article was widely uh, hailed as an accurate depiction of command failures in Iraq. Did Yingling rise to glory in the U.S. Army? No, he's now teaching high school in Northern Virginia, which is not a bad thing, but we would be better off if people who spoke the truth got rewarded. And by the way, it's worth noting here that the most common reason that U.S. military commanders are relieved is not poor performance on the battlefield, it's sexual misconduct. Yet the United States has not been winning the wars it's been in recently, which suggests that maybe they're not being led as well, or we're not being led as well as we would like. Now, I don't want to let my own profession off the hook here. Instead of having a large group of academic experts engaged by important policy issues and using the protection that tenure provides to challenge conventional wisdoms, to take controversial positions. Academics tend to be less and less interested in real world policy issues in the United States. And, and university-based scholars who can be independent are increasingly replaced by think tank analysts who are more dependent on soft money, uh, generally I think less independent, and often openly partisan. So the result here is that the one sector of society where new ideas and really uh, alternative, truly alternative perspectives might most readily emerge. Academia is less engaged, which then makes it more likely the United States repeats the same mistakes over and over.
I want to point to one final problem and then move on, and that's that we may have developed a system for staffing the foreign policy uh, organizations that is the worst of all possible worlds. Uh, each president gets to fill about 3,000 positions in the U.S. government, presidential appointees. About 800 of these require Senate confirmation. Uh, so we're talking the secretaries of state and defense, undersecretaries, deputy secretaries, assistant secretaries, and on down. Uh, this means tremendous turnover whenever the White House changes hands, bringing in people who may lack experience, may not be fully up to speed on current issues. This is as if uh, Apple or IBM or GE replaced its entire upper management system every four or eight years. Now, politics is not the same as business, but no other great power operates this way. No other great power has this much leadership turnover on a regular basis. At the same time, our appointments process of actually getting these people into their jobs has gone off the rails. Uh, the confirmation process now is slow, arbitrary, often takes months. Uh, this means that the permanent national security bureaucracy, the people who are permanent civil servants, is really in charge, not the people we elect or the people that they want to appoint, which is, again, this is why the same policies often persist over time. And just one final footnote here, the U.S. is the only major power that routinely allows amateurs to serve as ambassadors. Uh, over 30 percent of U.S. ambassadorial appointments, Democratic and Republican alike, go to campaign contributors, not to professional diplomats. And some of them do a great job, but in general, this is not an ideal practice. Last but not least, we have a four-year presidential term where the election campaign lasts over a year, which means the country and the incumbent are distracted for about 25 percent of a president's term by choosing uh, either to reelect him or, in theory, her, or electing a new one. Now, if you put all those reasons together, the real question is not why American foreign policy fails, but why it ever succeeds. And the reason, and it goes back to my very first point about our geopolitical position, is that we're in such good shape, we can make lots of mistakes and still be okay. So let me close by anticipating one obvious counter-argument to what I've been saying. You could argue that the United States has learned from past mistakes and is making intelligent adjustments. We're out of Iraq, we're getting out of Afghanistan, enthusiasm for counterinsurgency is gone. There was very little support for military action in Syria. Instead, we've turned to diplomacy in Syria, on Israel-Palestine, with Iran. So the lesson is our system, despite all the flaws I've talked about, does adapt over time. You could even, if you were a real optimist, imagine Obama ending his presidency with some big foreign policy wins, a nuclear deal with Iran, maybe even progress towards a two-state solution in the Middle East, maybe some kind of agreement now on uh, Ukraine. Well, I certainly hope uh, all those things happen, but I would offer the following cautionary points. First, we have a long way to go before we get a deal on any of the issues that are on the current agenda, and Obama will have to overcome a lot of obstacles to get there. Uh, recent events, in fact, to my mind, are not compelling evidence of skillful foreign policy making. Uh, Obama and Kerry painted themselves into a corner on Syria. They actually had to get bailed out by, of all people, Vladimir Putin, and were no closer to ending that conflict. There was no new American initiative on Iran. The key event was the election of a more moderate Iranian president who began a major outreach towards us and towards others. Now, I think Obama reacted well to that outreach, but also very cautiously. Um, and again, we still don't know if we're going to be able to negotiate and uh, get approved a permanent deal. Kerry has worked very hard to produce a peace deal between Israel and the Palestinians, but like all his predecessors, he's failed. And again, it's because he followed the same basic U.S. playbook, offering carrots but not sticks, and got exactly the same result. Uh, the entire American handling of the Ukraine problem has been singularly inept, and I'm happy to say more about that if anybody is interested. Um, and one final thing, I would worry a little bit about the inconstancy of American policy. In the first term, remember, we were going to reduce our role in the Middle East. We were rebalancing to Asia. But then, of course, 
In the second term, we reversed course and got back deeply embedded in Middle East problems. And of course, then this week, we're back to rebalancing in Asia. This is just another sign of how hard it has become for the United States to set clear priorities and stick to them. Um, the irony, and it's uh, an unfortunate irony, is that we probably won't get better at this until another big looming threat comes along and forces us to focus uh, again. All right, let me just wrap up. Uh, having offered up all this doom and gloom, uh, I want to close on a note of optimism because I'm basically an optimistic person. Um, the American political system doesn't seem to be particularly good at doing foreign policy these days, but it may not matter very much, at least for us. China, in my view, is likely to face significant problems in the years ahead. The EU is mired in its own economic troubles. Those are going to take a long time to resolve, although the news in the last few months has been better. The Middle East is going to be racked by instability for many years to come. It's going to take quite a while for the implications of the Arab Spring to work their way out uh, there. India, Brazil, and Turkey are all facing headwinds economically and politically. And in the meantime, the United States economy is recovering. The advent of the shale gas revolution is going to make us energy independent and contribute substantially to future economic growth. In terms of the global balance of power, the sort of long term here, the United States is going to be in pretty good shape for many years to come, which of course merely confirms Otto von Bismarck's famous observation that there is a special providence that looks out for drunkards, fools, and the United States of America. Given how we tend to approach foreign policy, that is something for which Americans should be grateful and perhaps close allies like Australia should be grateful for as well. Thank you. I look forward to hearing Bates's reactions and your questions and comments. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. I'll just... Uh, stay down here and try to field what I'm sure are going to be uh, dozens of uh, questions and queries and pushbacks and counterpoints. Um, as you were going on talking about Washington, D.C., it, it all sounded so very familiar to me, um, having spent uh, about 12 years of my career in those very circles. And um, I, don't think you're, I don't think you're too far off. I mean, there's, there's a very uh, strong-willed uh, self-interest, indeed. Yeah. Um, to, to, to have this American activism uh, globally. And I think it, it does tend to result in some of the very problems that you've, that you've noted. What strikes me, though, um, as so remarkable about that is that in the same breath, you can say, uh, in all honesty, uh, that the vast majority of Americans uh, simply don't have an interest at all uh, in these in, in the world generally uh, and, um, uh, and don't really have that strong of an opinion, I don't think, about, uh, about the degree of American activism abroad. Um, that's probably a gross generalization, but um, it's remarkable uh, how often we encounter that as soon as you sort of stepped outside of the, um, the Washington Beltway or any of the other sort of principal cities of the, of the country. And, and the question arises, you gave us some explanation about how uh, uh, that public somehow gets misinformed or duped or convinced uh, to move in, in ways that they might not themselves see as all that uh, in their own interest otherwise. So it's an interesting uh, twist and an interesting contradiction. Another thing that arose as you spoke, and I'd be interested to hear if folks in this room would agree, as you spoke of that sort of uh, elite um, and, and, and how it uh, unfortunately can undermine uh, judicious thinking about American power and activism abroad. Um, I think you could extend that argument, and maybe you should try in your, in your book, uh, to counterpart circles in major capitals around the world. Wow. I mean, I think it'd be fair to say that you could find similar groups of persons uh, in other capitals, without naming any, of course, right now. <laughs> Um, around the world who also share an interest in this American activism. 
who see that as part of their, whatever you want to call it, identity or self-interest, uh, and who may well be further fueling the, 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 the problems of American activism that you've just described, uh, because they're, in a, in a sense, a cheerleading squad. Um, that's uh, maybe another added issue to, to think about. But um, I'd like to hear from all the folks around the room. Um, we have, I think, about, uh, oh, a half an hour or so, I think. Uh, is that about right? Maybe a little bit, a little bit uh, less than that, but we'll try to get as many questions out as we can. So let me um, ask some folks to raise their hands if they would. I see this gentleman here, please. Go ahead. Uh, and then we'll, this gentleman. And yeah, I'd, I'd be grateful also if people just identify themselves, who they are. Sure. Chris Skinner, I'm a visiting lecturer at uh, Sydney University, but my connection here, I guess, is a member of the United States Naval Institute and the United States Naval Submarine League and uh, various engineering institutions. Um, you made a very passing comment at the end about China being faced with various challenges. Um, you did not mention anything about the South or East China Sea confrontations with nearby countries. But you did mention the uh, almost um, independence of the USA in terms of energy, particularly uh, shale gas and oil. Would you agree that a very major issue where the US could play a very important and effective role would be to acknowledge the dependence of Japan, South Korea, and China on imported oil from the Middle East, and that this drives their interest in the Indian and Pacific Oceans, the North Pacific Ocean, uh, whereas the US uh, general public might not understand that. Yeah, I, I think that's correct. Uh, a point I made in a talk I gave earlier today about how one of the things we have to understand about, about China's rise is that they, unlike, say, the Soviet Union during the Cold War, China does depend on both exporting to foreign markets but also importing raw materials, as I don't need to tell anyone from Australia. Uh, and if you import things from all over the world and export things all over the world, you do care about sea lines of communication and you do care about waters that might get blockaded. Um, you also care what may be happening in some of those places. So I think as China continues to grow, it will want to have influence in a variety of places out of its own strategic interests. Whether or not they're going to be able to attain that influence is another question. Um, and I think you know, Americans who work on this do understand that and anticipate that you're going to see China attempting to project power as it, it rises. And you know, my view is that that's going to cause significant tensions, if not outright conflict and rivalry between the United States and China because we do not want China to be able to dominate Asia, uh, say, the way the United States uh, dominates the Western Hemisphere. Yeah, yeah. Right, right here is a gentleman. Uh... Hey. hey. We, we can't hear we, this, we, this, is an, uh, this is an old friend and former student. We, we can't hear you on the video if you don't. Thank you. On that, Steve. Um, Professor Wald used to be one of my professors when I was a graduate student, and uh, it's good to see him here, one of the uh, better lecturers that I've, that I've had. Uh, no, he's great, he's great, he's great. Um, anyway, so what I'd like to ask Professor Wald, I still see you as Professor Wald, so I'm yeah. going to address you as such. If to the extent that President Obama has a coherent foreign policy, where would you put it on the neoliberal, sort of neoliberal, <coughs> excuse me, neorealism spectrum? Um, the uh, I think that most uh, American presidents, and I would include Obama in this, uh, are a sort of an amalgam of uh, liberal ideals and uh, realpolitik pragmatism. Nobody, no American president likes to talk in realist or realpolitik terms. You know, they don't like to say things like, we're doing this out of our own selfish interest to maximize our power and influence, and we don't care who gets in our way, we'll crush them. They do things like that, but they tend not to say it that way. They tend to say that they're advancing liberty or spreading democracy or building a stable world order, things like that. And I think Obama is actually not that different from his predecessors. It would have been impossible to imagine a, a, any U.S. president in 2008 not uh, 
sobering up a bit and retrenching somewhat. Uh, not only have we been fighting two very costly losing wars, but we'd had this major financial meltdown. And when you make a series of big mistakes and you've lost some money, everybody regroups and retrenches a little bit. So, uh, you know, I believe if McCain had been uh, elected, uh, he would have actually been forced by necessity to adjust things a little bit. But one also doesn't want to exaggerate that. You know, Obama did escalate in Afghanistan. He has been very uh, energetic in using U.S. special forces in various parts of the world. Um, as soon as they came up with the idea of the Asian pivot, about two weeks later, they had to abandon the word pivot because if you're pivoting to Asia, that implies you're pivoting away from somewhere else. And you don't want to suggest that we're abandoning anywhere. Again, it just shows you that the American foreign policy establishment still thinks in very much global terms. I think Obama is, is not all that different from his predecessors in the sort of overall thrust of foreign policy. And that's in part because, remember, he sits on top of a very large foreign policy establishment. And there's only a limited amount of leeway that even uh, you know, a popular president has to, to make those sorts of adjustments. Let me try and take two questions. This gentleman here and this gentleman here. And then we hopefully have some people in the back that are willing to um, raise their hand. Oh, there we go. Good. So, sir and sir, please. Here, let's go here first. Catherine, please. He's been waiting patiently. Thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Gerard Hosier. I uh, spent 20 years covering wars that uh, were of interest uh, to the Americans with the uh, American Broadcasting Company. Um, just uh, you're t talking about the um, network and interests of interpersonal relationships and how that dooms American foreign policy um, and the agency's uh, uh, sort of subconscious interests being different to American national interests. Um, for example, JFK, when he sort of challenged those interests, got a lot of pushback. Um, is there, uh, um, whose interests do the agencies really have at heart? And may I mm -hmm. ask one more question, please? Thank you. Just to get some, thank you. Mine perhaps on a, a similar note, Brandon Peach, by the way. Um, uh, you mentioned the supremacy of the US military, yet mm -hmm. since the Second World War, um, and obviously your great success in Granada against the 50,000 people of Granada, uh, US military policy has been a failure. You lost in China when you're supporting the Guomindang. There's a draw in Korea, uh, despite the success of MacArthur uh, in Chong. Um, you, Vietnam was possibly a draw. Um, you're bogged down, as you pointed out, in the Middle East, in Afghanistan and uh, Iraq. Uh, yet you alluded to the successes, uh, the success of the reunification of, uh, of Germany. And the reunification of Germany had little to do with US military power. It was that famous speech by the spokesperson for the, uh, the, Centre, uh, the Communist Party of uh, East Germany. And when asked when uh, they go in the open doors, the famous so fought, and the people just rushed uh, to the gates. And that obviously just the whole thing fell apart. Uh, you also alluded to the fall of the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union's fall had little to do with US military power. It, dealt more with Mikhail Gorbachev's concern that the, uh, the Soviet Union was spending so much of its budget on military and not providing uh, 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 consumer goods. Uh, American military policy seems to be in a failure, um, yet they seem to pursue it continually. Um, and perhaps alluding to Edelman's statement is uh, Eisenhower's uh, famous term about the, the military industrial complex having a, a self-fulfilling objective. So perhaps Bates is quite correct to actually put our two questions together because it actually deals with, with the fallacy of US policy being based on the military and not on a soft diplomacy. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think I can put those two together. I think perfect segue. Doom, doom is a little too strong a word. The, the, the incestuous nature of the foreign policy standard doesn't doom our foreign policy. It doesn't fail in, in every regard. Um, what I think it, it, well, I think it, what it does what we mostly suffer for is from a very narrow debate. Not really, and, and the end of the Cold War is actually quite illustrative. This is an earthquake in, in international affairs, right? We have a bipolar world and one of the poles disappears. And you would think that Americans would have then had a big debate back home about what our role in the world should be. 
given that the reason we were in all these places and doing all these things was the Soviet threat. Well, the Soviet threat is gone. Maybe we ought to reconsider it. And maybe we should change, maybe we shouldn't. My point is that there was hardly any discussion in the United States over what the implications of that were, except for our giving ourselves high fives and being glad that we'd won the Cold War. We maintained all of the alliances that we had, and we expanded them. Right? Instead of saying, you know, great, we won, let's come home and build some roads and bridges and better schools. And again, one can have a serious argument about whether or not that was, would have been the right thing for the United States to do. The point is that the discussion wasn't even begun. About four academics that nobody paid any attention to raised this possibility. Um, and that, that's part of what I mean by that. I think I disagree with you about American military policy. You, you put the, uh, the, you identified some of the obvious failures, but I'd say that the American military is actually good at, and very successful at certain things and very bad at some other things, and we succeed when we do the things we're good at, and we're bad, we fail when we do the things we're bad at. We're very good at deterring major conventional aggression. That was, in fact, what helped win the Cold War. We're pretty good at reversing it when it occurs. The first Gulf War, when Iraq goes into Kuwait and we, we throw them out. Um, so in that sense, I think American military policy was quite successful uh, in stabilizing uh, relations in Asia and stabilizing, obviously, relations in Europe. What the American military is, oh, and by the way, we're pretty good at overthrowing weak governments. Uh, we've done that pretty easily, as Saddam Hussein could tell you and as the Taliban could tell you. We went in and took care of them quite uh, easily. What our military is not very good at, and nobody's is very good at, is running other countries. Right? We're not very good at occupying countries and governing them, particularly when we don't understand them, we don't know much about their culture, when, those, uh, when they're ethnically divided, when they're poor, and when they have a history of foreign occupation that makes them very angry when foreigners show up and try to tell them what to do. Right? And we're not, in my view, going to get better at that if we keep practicing. Right. Um, so, so the lesson is the United States and its military should concentrate on doing the things that it's pretty good at doing, um, maintaining a set of alliances in Asia and trying to maintain regional stability here. I don't think we need to do much in Europe these days because even allowing for what's going on in Ukraine, I don't think direct military threats to Europe uh, really uh, exist, so we don't have to do much there. But that's what the American military is good at doing. We should get out of the business of trying to run other countries, particularly when we have no idea how to do that. Sir, there in the back. Thank you. Could you wait for the microphone, please? Thank you. Israel and Palestine, uh, bearing in mind that the United States um, uh, objected to the uh, pal pal Palestinians gaining some partial recognition in the, United, uh, in the United Nations. How can it really be said that the Americans can be uh, play a, a, a useful role when they too seem too closely aligned with the, Israel's interests? The second part of my question, the second part of my point, is this: and is a question. The United States, what I was should be um, back in 1956, the United States refused to assist Israel and England and France in regards to the Suez Crisis. The United States uh, stand at that time not to be involved should be applauded. Why is it then that the United States has not invited other parties, uh, including Arab countries and, uh, say, the uh, independent countries such as uh, the Scandinavian countries, to make it a joint effort rather than uh, being, uh, being involved in itself with the peace process when the Arabs probably distrust it and it's been seen too closely aligned with, the, with Israel's position? Um. Well, if you're wondering why American Middle East policy is screwed up and its policy on uh, Israel-Palestine has not been very successful, there is a book I could recommend uh, that, that, that you read. Um, the one which I think explains, you know, 80 percent of what's, uh, what's wrong with our handling of that particular uh, issue, the only place I would disagree is that our policy has, in fact, not been in Israel's interest either. All right, that we have basically subsidized and tolerated and provided political cover for a very self-destructive policy uh, on Israel's part, namely the occupation and the continued expansion of settlements. This is, uh, I think, a potential disaster for Israel, and it's not something that a true friend should have done. 
Um, so Americans, some Americans may think this has been supportive of Israel. I actually think it's been, been quite uh, harmful and quite destructive. And I believe, you know, historians will look back and wonder what the United States w was thinking. Uh, I fear, uh, as someone who has supported a two-state solution, I fear that the that point of no return has already been crossed, and therefore we're going to have to face a series of much less attractive alternatives uh, that are going to produce, you know, continued problems for us and for Israel and obviously for everybody else uh, in the region as well. Uh, the gentleman there in the back has had his hand up for a little while, and we'll recognize that. Let's get a couple more questions then for you, Stephen. Uh, my name's David. I'm no one of consequence. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's a clear. There's a cliche of American politics that presidents are elected on the basis of domestic issues because that's what the people care about, so that's what they campaign on. They try to carry out their domestic platform. They're blocked at every turn by Congress. They give up on it and they go off and do foreign policy things for eight years because that, that's at least they can get something done there. Um, do you think that's a major factor? So you end up with a lot of, of presidents who have no interest in foreign policy but spend all their time doing it. Um, do you think that's a major factor in having a weak foreign policy? Do you think it's a, a, a bigger factor for America than it is for other countries? Mm. Um, and as a, a cautionary story for this one, you listed as a stellar example of good American foreign policy, 1945 to 52. Now, that's pretty much exactly the Truman presidency. You probably wouldn't accuse Harry S. Truman, as admirable a fellow as he was, of being a man who was particularly interested in foreign policy. I don't think, um, yet he's, it, it seems to have worked under him. Can you explain any of this? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I'm still wrestling with the, the you know, fully explaining the success, successful moments. But I think, first of all, part of it, if we tend to focus, naturally, enormous attention on the president. Right. And you know, the Truman line, the buck stops here, sort of understandable. Uh, and the question I got earlier from Chris, you know, sort of where do you put Obama? As though it's sort of what's in the president's head that drives this. And we saw this with the Bush administration. Everyone wanted to blame everything on George W. Bush. It's all his fault. Um, and what I've been suggesting is that it's not just the president's. It's really the entire establishment per se. Uh, what I think explains the success of the Truman, it certainly wasn't Terry Truman's deep strategic understanding of world relationships or anything like that. It's that I think there were a number of very gifted uh, foreign policy uh, advisors, a very small number of them, I might add, uh, who managed to sort of figure out what needed to be done and do it. Uh, George Marshall, George Kennan. Uh, a number of others. Uh, the policy planning staff under George Kennan was, I think, six people. The Marshall Plan was basically put together by less than a dozen human beings. Now we have this vast establishment. We have it's actually quite a, a, a burdensome bureaucracy. Any of my friends who have gone and spent a couple of years in Washington talk about how difficult it is to get anything done. Right, the number of meetings, the amount of backbiting, the uh, amount of sand in the gears uh, that they have to face. One of the things that I think Truman didn't have to worry about was whether or not you, know, you could actually get things done rather quickly, uh, and they did. On your first point, I mean, is it that foreign policy is just easier because you don't have to pay as much attention to Congress? I don't think that's what's really uh, driving it. Uh, when Obama got elected, he came in with an enormously ambitious agenda. If you go back and look at some of the speeches and some of the initiatives that were launched, and it was ambitious both at home and abroad, right? Um, and it wasn't that he went to foreign policy. He was going to try and do everything uh, all at once. And in fact, I would argue that by and large, the Obama foreign policy has not been very successful, uh, that they haven't achieved most of the goals that they laid out in the first th three or four months. And the only significant achievements in foreign policy have been sort of negative achievements. They did get out of Iraq. They will get out of Afghanistan. But if you look at the other things, they've made some progress on nuclear security, but, uh, and they did get bin Laden. But you know, they don't have a deal with Iran yet. They uh, failed miserably on Israel-Palestine. Relationship with Russia is worse. The relationship with China is no better, et cetera. Um, I don't, but I don't think it's the domestic versus foreign policy trade-off that really matters. This gentleman here. But just right there, yes, sir. 
Thanks. I'm Andrew, and I'm also known of consequence. Uh, and highlighting U.S. foreign policy failures in Iran, you touched on the change of leadership, the slight liberalization in Iran, is something that had very little to do with U.S. actions. But are there any roles of the U.S. and EU sanctions on oil that led that were previous to that? What what role does that have? Because those sanctions were largely without the backing of Russia and China, and they were U.S. and EU sanctions. Is there any connection? Is that at all a success, or is that something you view as largely an internal issue in Iran? Um, <clears throat> Uh, you could make the argument, and certainly uh, most people in the United States believe this, that the sanctions program, and particularly getting really tough about sanctions, and especially the financial sanctions, making it harder for Iran to do business in the international uh, you know, financial community. Uh, finally, you know, they, that Rouhani is basically saying uncle. Right? And I think that's much too facile. Uh, first of all, Iran made an offer sort of similar to what they're asking for now way back in 2006, 2007. All right, so it's not like ratcheting up the sanctions has suddenly altered their position. This is a position they've held uh, at previous moments and that we had rejected. Uh, secondly, um, they have continued to expand the nuclear program throughout this entire period. So we've had sanctions on them since shortly after 2000, and it doesn't seem to have altered the program, as I said at the beginning, you know, they had zero centrifuges operating 14 years ago, and now they've got over, I think they have 19,000 installed and over 10,000 are actually spinning. So if sanctions were this magic tool, you'd have think they'd have had more impact. And there's not much sign yet that they're sort of caving on a lot of key issues, right? If we're going to get a long-term deal with Iran, it will be a deal where both sides give. We're not going to get everything we've been demanding, which has been a complete, until recently, a complete secession of their program, and they're not going to get everything they might, might want, and we're still trying to figure out if there's a, a space in there. And that's just consistent, by the way, with everything we know about economic sanctions, which is that they're a relatively weak tool of coercion against countries that are really highly uh, resolved about this. I think that the Rouhani and the so-called more moderate views reflect uh, a widespread Iranian view that they would like to be back as a welcome member of the international community and that they understand they have to resolve this issue with us in order to fully uh, achieve that. Um, and I don't want to sort of go too far and talk about Iran as a great democratic country, but the fact is they did hold an election and it achieved a result that most people didn't expect. Rouhani won, and Rouhani then was put in office and has been exercising authority there. So it's a lot more democratic than, say, Saudi Arabia, our close ally. Um, and that, to me, suggests that there's an opening there that we should be working very hard to explore, because if you do think of things that could improve you know, our ability to influence events, it would be to have a different relationship with Iran and have Iran have a different relationship with us as well. Um, I, we have time for two more questions, and I'd like to, there's a lady in the back there, and I'll ask this lady here in the front, so we hear from some, I'm sorry? I'm a PhD student from Germany. Did you hear that? Yes, okay. I, you, the, you're from Germany. Yeah, I'm Miriam. I'm Willkommen. a PhD student from Germany, and I actually, my research focuses on the role of interest groups in U.S. foreign policy, and uh, in particular with Iran. And um, my question, you mentioned the impact of interest groups in U.S. foreign policy, but how much weight put, would you put into it, into their role um, regarding Iran? Okay. Oh, and Good. another, you, you wanted to cede your question to someone, did you? Well, he uh, had his hand. <laughs> oh, who is that? A young man. Oh, well. Um, I'm Parth Gulati, undergrad student studying international and global studies at Sydney University. Um, my question is regarding your statement on how remarkably, remarkably secure or geopolitically secure the U.S. is. Um, recent discourse about the national security implications of climate change um, coming from CNA, which you've been associated with before. Um, just want to ask, what, is, what do you, could you just comment on what the United States stands on environmental security is and do you actually think if they're secure in that sense? Would okay. you like to take the last question, please? Yeah, yeah. I, I can handle three. I can't count any higher than that. But. 
and uh, I'm a former U.S. citizen, now an Australian citizen. Um, I taught political politics at various universities, and I also worked as a senior bureaucrat in New South Wales. But um, I mean, I'm uh, I'm actually in Australia due to the Kennedy, uh, well, the Cuban missile standoff. Um, but I won't go into that. Uh, <laughs> except to say, I, d I would like to say that I found that I f in your um, explanations and your elaborations that the um, un underlying global economic interests, um, uh, they had a lot to do with all the, uh, well, to and fro within the establishment. Uh, and p putting the U.S. interests first. You know, they may not be their interest to keep defending them, but that's been a motivation. Uh, and the other thing uh, that I wanted to suggest is that um, when, uh, like with Iran, there's a, there's, there must always be, there, you haven't suggested that there's this business of, oh, we can't be seen to back down. Mm. Right, and how is the U.S. supposed to get out of that? Because, uh, well, I leave it there. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay. Um, those Steve, are, if you wouldn't mind tackling those, and we'll have to wrap up, but there'll be time after, I think, to yeah. talk with Steve. Um, okay, so the first question, interest groups, uh, and, and it's particularly with regard to Iran. Um, one of the things we say in our book on the Israel lobby is that, that much of American policy towards Iran in recent years, last 20 years or so, has been heavily driven by groups like AIPAC. Most Americans, again, don't care about it very much, but if you look at the interest groups in the United States who have pushed hardest for the United States to confront Iran, and in particular have wanted to keep the military option on the table. It's groups like AIPAC, um, and largely because of the, the rather poisonous relationship between Iran uh, and Israel. Until relatively recently, they kind of had the field to themselves. Nobody else was on the other side of that particular debate. And what's really interesting um, in the last couple of years is you see the emergence of groups like NIAC, which is the National Iranian American Council, uh, which is a group of Iranian Americans uh, who want a better relationship with Iran, and also many key elements of the American arms control community who favor a diplomatic deal as opposed to the use of military force to address. So if you, if you paid any attention to this back earlier this year, um, when there was a sort of big push to try and derail the interim deal, um, and this was a, a push led by APAC and its, some of its uh, allies in Congress, there was a counter-mobilization, right, which had not happened before of a whole series of groups that had managed to coordinate to sort of put a different set of ideas in the heads of congressmen. And, and the Obama administration, by the way, was supporting that other coalition. So you see that, that in this case, interest groups really did matter. And the fact that there was something of a balance of power between the two sides allowed the administration to continue to move forward uh, with diplomacy. Uh, on climate change and American security, I uh, am not an expert on this at all, and I uh, have often say that this is one of these great wild cards, that uh, if the worst case of uh, environmental change is realized, it will make a lot of the things uh, that foreign policy folks have been arguing about and debating and discussing for the last 20 or 30 years seem kind of like small change. So, so I, I take your point. Uh, that climate change could have really quite dramatic effects uh, on the United States. The United States, however, will be in a better position to deal with most of those effects than most other countries because it's wealthy, um, because it's going to be able to spend the money to mitigate some of those effects, partly because of our own geography. You know, we're not, uh, we have our, we have low-lying areas, and I occasionally wonder just how many feet or meters my house is above sea level. Um, but, uh, but I don't think it's going to be a, I mean, if, if the worst case of climate change occurs, then yes, then the United States will be affected along with everyone else. It will be in relatively better shape, but it will, it'll still be harmed. So that, that was outside my discussion. And then finally on, um, on economic interests and resolve, uh, I actually don't think a, a much of American foreign policy is driven heavily by economic interests with the possible exception of, 
maintaining access to oil in various parts of the world, uh, maintaining a sort of global supply uh, of energy. And that is going to be changing as we gain more uh, resources ourselves. And the easiest way to see that is, of course, the, the speed with which the United States is willing to impose economic sanctions on any country that it's mad at at any particular point. If economic interests were driving our security policy, you wouldn't see that happen uh, as much. It's not to say we, you know, we like free trade, we like uh, investment, we especially like free trade when it works in our favor. Um, um, but, but by and large, I, just don't, I have never bought the sort of, you know, it, capitalism is what's driving uh, a lot of American foreign policy. Um, and yes, uh, resolve is something that we worry about and probably should. I think we pr often overemphasize it as well. The fact is that the United States has backed down on numerous occasions uh, when it was in our interest to do so. Uh, and smart presidents and smart diplomats sort of know how to do that in a way that doesn't lead people to question, um, you know, your commitments in other areas. Um, as I said over, over Syria, the fact that we didn't react in Syria, which in my view would not have been a good thing, um, tells you absolutely nothing about how we would react in areas that we care more about and where we might have options that would really make things better as opposed to conceivably making things worse.